coming to Myanmar is for me a profoundly personal journey into my own family history. My father was born here and carved out a successful career as a doctor until the military seized control in 1962. Targeted by the state for being an Indian national, he was forced to abandon his home and flee overseas. Part of a mass exodus of an estimated 300,000 ethnic Indians. Modern day Myanmar is still racked by ethnic divisions, but life here is transforming. One of the biggest changes is in free speech. Tonight, a live comedy show is being broadcast to the nation to mark International Peace Day. The organizer is Zaganar, Myanmar's most famous comedian and a former political prisoner. Zaganar, what does tonight symbolize? Uh, we can see this is the first time in history of our country. Every people can, can watch and every comedian can speak their jokes freely. There are no censor, no ban. Over the 35 numbers of the minister will come to here, they will sit there and they can listen how the comedians criticize them. Former Major General Ong Min is a government minister and a key peace negotiator. He's taken up Zaganar's invitation to hear the comedian's barbs firsthand. But the opening act begins with an unexpectedly serious message. The jokes that follow take aim at the government's economic mismanagement, the soaring price of living and widespread corruption. <laughs> the humour may seem mild, but this is a country where, until recently, comedians had to submit their gags to government censors. Tonight, even the minister is laughing along. So, Ross, what have you witnessed as far as the pace of change in Myanmar? Well, things have definitely quickened up immensely. I mean, it wasn't so long ago that people were riding around on push bikes and dilapidating. Few Australians are watching Myanmar's transition to democracy as avidly as Ross Dunkley, the country's only foreign media magnate. People are enjoying their, their first taste of democracy in half a century. He arrived here 13 years ago, building a unique and sometimes testy relationship with the generals to set up the nation's first independent weekly newspaper. A lot of people were critical about the Myanmar Times, that we were lackeys of the junta, that, that we were prostitutes. We were just on the ground engaging with the military dictatorship. We were of the view that it's better to be on the field and playing than, than off the field and screaming like some hysterical housewife. Every week, we were attempting to lift the bar just a little bit higher. While newspaper readership is collapsing elsewhere in the world, in Myanmar, business is booming. It was only in April this year that the government ended a state monopoly on the daily press. For the previous five decades, it had been more interested in censoring, jailing or torturing journalists deemed critical of the state. You know, here in Myanmar, um, it's, it's, a, it's a booming media scene mm. and um, with the relaxation of censorship um, in the last six months we've had 13 dailies um, um, open up. That's incredible. 13 dailies in six months. Here's a few of the selection uh, of, of, of these dailies. The Voice, the Yangon Times, the Seven Day Daily, well, here's a, here's the Freedom of Speech. 
um, for, for me is, is, has got to be at the forefront of, of any change. Unless you can have a free and open media, how can you claim to have any sort of democracy? For me, that's the baseline. is about one of the most contentious issues in the new Myanmar, land grabs by the country's former military rulers. Just a few years ago, a gathering like this would never have been tolerated by the authorities. These people have been fighting for more than 20 years to regain their land in southeast Yangon. <laughs> A thousand families lost their homes. It's the kind of injustice we hear again and again. Under draconian old laws still in place, demonstrators can face hefty jail sentences simply for protesting without permission. In this case, the authorities had agreed, but protesters were being closely watched. Around the corner, we found four truckloads of police ready to react to any trouble. We need peace. Because of the 2008 constitution, we have so many problems and we have so many conflicts in our country. For activists like Generation Wave leader Komo Thwe, political change hasn't made life much easier. Last year, he led a peace rally without getting permission. He and eight other organizers now face up to 20 years in prison and a grueling trial process that's more like a full-time job. How many times have you been to court? Uh, I think more than 130 times we have been in the court. More than 130? Yes. Yeah, 130. Wow. Yeah. How do you view this particular government? I would say that the country has changed uh, than before. But the thing is, we, we, we need to wait and watch carefully where this change is leading to. So we cannot say everything will be good. One of the key milestones of Myanmar's reforms has been the release of hundreds of political prisoners. But many remain behind bars, with new arrests and trials still being reported every month. I've come to see Than Mo, a woman who knows only too well how those viewed as troublemakers are treated. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Her husband, Ko Tin Cho, is a veteran political campaigner. How does it make you feel when you look at pictures of your husband? At a protest three months ago, he planned to make a citizen's arrest on a businessman he accused of land grabbing, but he ended up in custody himself. Charged with insulting the state, he faces two years in jail. Than Moore is three months pregnant and is now faced with bringing up her baby alone. Talkie, Shell and Bobo 
are former political prisoners. Between them, they've racked up 30 years in jail. Faced with the difficulties of life on the outside, they set up Golden Harp, a taxi company with a difference. Hi, can I hop in? Thanks. There's a deep stigma attached to being a political prisoner in today's Myanmar. It's hard to find employment or to be accepted by society. Golden Heart provides valuable stability for former prisoners. But it also gives drivers like Shell a chance to educate their mainly foreign passengers. We're on our way to a place well known to employees of Golden Harp. Yangon's sprawling, insane prison. Notorious for the mental and physical torture inflicted on its inmates. Have you ever asked Shell to stop being involved in politics? Sometimes I would like him to stop, but he, he doesn't want to stop. <laughs> Shell's wife, Luin Ma, says, like everyone in Myanmar, all they want is a life free from oppression. But even now, the couple are worried that Shell could be arrested at any time. Even now, I was worried for his health because he was mentally or physically tortured for nearly 14 years. Do you still see evidence of all that time that Shell spent in prison? Sometimes he doesn't want to stay alone at all. Because he thought he will be captured. So he always tried to go out if I was not at all. Oh my goodness. Because he was locked in the isolated for the many, many years. This is our life. We cannot stop it. Me and my girls, me and my girls. Me it's the younger generation who are lapping up new freedoms and pushing boundaries. It's okay. I think it's age for a lot. <laughs> oh my god, no. <laughs> None more so than the Myanmar girls. Modelled on Britain's Spice Girls, they're the country's first all-girl group. And today they've invited me to their Yangon studio to watch a rehearsal for their latest single. We girls stand for like everybody who are sad, who are down and who feels unhappy about their life because now everything is changing and it starts to change right now. I'm stronger now, so it's goodbye. The Myanmar girls are out to smash the stereotype the women in Myanmar are timid and modest. But breaking the mold has its challenges, even for a pop band. That's perfect. In the past, the girls have had their lyrics and their fashions censored by the state. So these days, do you feel like you are allowed to sing about whatever you want? And we can sing whatever we want, but we have to sing in the boundary. We know how, how far we can go, so <laughs> <laughs> we are in the boundary, and, but we are still pushing the boundaries. And now the girls have been working hard for years to cut through the conservatism of their country. Now, with growing freedoms, these talented young women see a bright future. What do you think about the direction of this country right now? I believe our president and he's going really well and also we support our president to get good democracy.
I, I do believe and I want to believe that this will last forever. We just want to go forward. That's all we need to do and all we want to do. With its exposure to the world, Myanmar is attracting plenty of attention. The country has thrown its doors open to visitors. In the last year, the number of tourists has doubled and investors are flocking. So how does Myanmar's government rate its progress? I've come to what's surely one of the world's emptiest capital cities to find out. Naypyidaw was born in 2005 when parliament was built on a green field site 300 kilometers north of Yangon. Here, farmers live in the shadow of Myanmar's most powerful people and constant reminders of military rule. If there's a symbol of the bad old days, it's this, a 20-lane highway running past parliament that rarely sees more than a handful of cars. The sort of extravagance and waste of the former military government everyone hopes is consigned to the past as Myanmar travels its own road to democracy. Uya Tut is Myanmar's deputy information minister and spokesman for President Thein Sein. Uya Tut, thank you very much for speaking to us today. First of all, where are we on the path to democracy in this country? So now uh, we are entering the second uh, two and a half year of our transition to democracy. So if we look back to those past two and a half years, we made a lot of achievement. But now we also have the, a lot of challenges. Let's talk about the issue of political prisoners. How many are there in jail right now in Myanmar? Uh, I cannot tell that in exact number. A roundabout. I think just maybe two or three hundred. It does seem entirely contradictory to the notion of democracy, though, that there would be any political prisoners. That's what the president in jail said. Right now. The, in the end of this year, so he promised that there will be no more political prisoners in our country. And yet people who are protesting um, on political grounds are still finding themselves in prison for violating Article 18, yes. which is about not getting permission to protest. That seems to me, and to many others I'm sure watching this, nowhere near a serious enough issue to go to jail for, not even for a day. Yeah, but uh, that's a law. So that now that law was approved by the parliament and now the parliament is trying to review that particular article, Article 18. It wasn't that long ago that somebody would be jailed for criticising the uh, administration. How does it feel now to be on the side where you are being criticised? So in the first years, we are not very used to that kind of criticism. So sometimes some of the government officials are angry about that criticism. But the president set the example. You have to face this kind of criticism and what you have to do is, you know, to present the truth and to present the transparency of the government work. It's the best, best thing to deal with the media. How do you want the world to see Myanmar? So I want the world to see the Myanmar as, you know, the country and the people who are trying their best to achieve their democratic goal. Sometimes we lack the experience. So we want the, the international community to see we are struggling to get, achieve our goal and try, instead of blaming us, to please give the, your helping hand to us. Elections in 2015 will do much to test the government's appetite for change and the eyes of the world are watching. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, press conference. Today, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter is paying a visit after a series of meetings to check on democracy's progress. In the middle of the journalistic throng, veteran newspaper journalist and former political prisoner, the saw. Gentlemen at the front. Thank you, Mr. President. Are we moving? Is Nibar moving in the right direction and at the right pace? I think the entire world has been pleasantly surprised at the degree of progress that has already been made in just a brief two and a half years since the last election. But a lot of change still needs to be made here. Thank you very much. 
The magnitude of what this country still faces is daunting. Ethnic conflicts are ongoing, hundreds of laws have to be rewritten, and the constitution that bars Aung San Suu Kyi from ever becoming president needs to be overhauled. Bihar Saw says the people of Myanmar must be patient. As far as Myanmar's path to democracy, where are we at this present moment in time? We still have a long way to go, and then we're not really sure that we could reach there. And then that may take three years, maybe, maybe 20 years, we don't know. But then I think hopefully we have taken the first few steps in the right directions. Sometimes we lack of experience and lack of human resources and lack of financial and technical knowledge is a problem on our process. So let's be seen as a children who try to grow up and to enter the wall. <laughs> so you have to help us. <laughs>